Good morning. I see the clock started moving, but I still see an empty, uh, empty chair at the, uh, at the end of our, our table here. Hopefully, our, uh, hopefully Michael uh, Weiss will um, join us soon. Uh, my name's Larry Rutkowski. I'm a partner at the law firm of, uh, of Seward and Kissel uh, here in New York. And as uh, some of you out there know, and as some of these panelists know, I've spent virtually my entire career uh, in shipping, ship finance, other aspects of the, of the business. I've had the pleasure uh, of working with most of these, uh, most of these gentlemen during the, during the course of that career, although my hair is clearly grayer uh, than theirs, so uh, <coughs> I think that suggests they might be a bit younger than me. Uh, our panel today is supposed to address alternative uh, finance and private equity. Since, since Dan and his panel spent about a third of their time on private equity, maybe there's not a lot uh, for us left to, to say about that. I originally thought it would be great being sandwiched in between a bank debt panel and the capital markets uh, uh, panel to, uh, to follow um, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Oh, Michael, good, good to see you. <laughs> um, so, because I, uh, I think uh, we're well positioned and I think one of the things that we'll be talking about is really what was the subtext of the banking panel, whether they came right out and said it or, uh, or not, um, and you can, you can infer from the, the particular wording of what they said, what they were getting at, but there's not a lot of bank capital out there. Um, there is, there is uh, certainly not when you compare it to the heyday of 2007 and years before that. The financial crisis caused a lot of banks to, to pull back. Those banks that remain in the business, and besides those that were up here on the panel, I'm not sure uh, there were, uh, there are a lot. I mean, there are a couple, but I don't want to start naming them and then, and then inadvertently leave somebody off. Um, but, you know, we, we did hear uh, that um, you, you need good, solid cash flows, reputable customers, perhaps customers who've been with you for a long time. Um, and, and uh, leverage 50 to 60 percent, where it used to be much higher in other primary, um, uh, other parts of the cycle. We did hear, um, however, uh, some other, other news. Um, I think Tori Var Hansen, who specifically said he thought it was extremely important that, uh, that shipping companies diversify the sources of their capital. And that's what we're here to discuss about. Discuss. Alternative finance and private equity. This means non-bank. It means not capital markets. So we're not really going to talk about the capital markets. Um, we're, going to, we're going to talk about um, uh, what these gentlemen and their companies bring to the table. Because I think alternative finance um, means a lot of things to a lot of different, different people. And I think it's safe to say that while we do have representatives of private equity companies here and people who have partnered with private equity companies, a lot of what we're going to hear today is about this alternative finance. What is out there for a ship owner um, to utilize when the capital markets are unavailable or before they become open again and at a time when the banks are concentrating their risk in a relatively small, uh, small number of clients. Um, but just, just because we do and we are obligated to cover a little bit of the theme of private equity, I want to start by first turning to Art Regan, who I think you all know. Um, and uh, Art asked you to give us your overview of um, what's happened in the private equity space post-finance crisis. Okay, so Art Regan, um, operating partner with Apollo Global Management, which is a, a global asset manager. The pillars of Apollo's funding are private equity, credit platforms, natural resources, and real estate. Investing in the shipping industry has come from private equity, the credit platforms, and natural resources, obviously not with real estate. So um, to Larry's question, you know, the, 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 the dis distinction between private equity is, and credit platforms are, are more return-oriented and, and structural, I, I would say. So what we have done in the private equity space is take the deep dive the ability to write a very large check, 500 or a billion dollars, uh, but in that case, certainly looking for a of quite a high return, uh, something that would normally take not only asset appreciation but very good cash flows. And I think in most of the shipping industries over the last almost 
eight to 10 years now. We haven't seen the combination last for very long. So our investing strategy and our, our disposition has been, has kind of gravitated towards the credit platform where that, that ranges from some hedge fund oriented funding which uh, can have private equity like return requirements but also from more of a pure credit, some first lien debt within the maritime space which would come at a much lower cost of course. Uh, but also require a lot more structure. So I, and by that I mean it would have uh, contracted cash flows and probably be with a very good credit counterparty. So right now Apollo's focus is much more on structured financing, uh, sale leasebacks, first lien financing, but yes, we would be more expensive than commercial banks. Uh, but certainly within natural resources, there is always a, an interest. There's been some very large investments done in upstream in the commodities themselves. So understanding how shipping fits into the global marketplace and distribution is quite easy for a firm like Apollo. So we do know the shipping space and know how to manage an investment if need be, but can also act as a, a passive equity partner to a very well-founded company, which there are so many of them in the world now. So I would say in answer to your question, Larry, uh, private equity, pure private equity, I don't think there's much of an appetite within the asset management landscape for pure private equity any longer, but certainly there remains quite a lot of interest from more hedge fund and credit oriented strategies, but it is a different approach. Just a, one, one follow-up question to that. You say there's not enough, uh, or there's not a lot of uh, interest in private equity for putting large amounts into, into shipping and the investment, I guess, equity side is really what you're, you're saying. Is, is that because um, most private equity firms that put money in in 2008, 2009, 2010 were surprised at, uh, at how long um, the market stayed down uh, and how much trouble there was for companies to, let's say, go to Wall Street and use one of the more uh, traditional exit strategies, or was it a combination of both? Well, probably a combination of both, unfortunately. The uh, traditional exit strategy being a capital market event was on everybody's checklist in the early days of the large private equity investments, and that has, that has really dried up. So that's definitely a challenge. How do you exit an investment in, in particularly the tanker sector? There's been such a poor run of earnings, you can't even sell assets. So if you go deep, so private equity, if your private equity likes to write much bigger uh, placements in an investment. So therefore, in shipping, particularly when the market turns down, you have a lot of assets you have to get, you have to dispose of if you want to exit an investment. If you don't have access to the capital markets to do a block trade or, or some kind of uh, transitional investment for a publicly traded company, it's, it's impossible really to get out if you're having to sell 10, 15, 20, 30, 30 assets. Um, so I think it is, I think it is a combination of both and it's probably most rooted in the inability to exit for private equity. Thank you. We may, we may come back to some of those themes, but I want to uh, continue to move down uh, the panel. The, the next speaker uh, to, to Art's left, uh, your right, is uh, Shantanu Agarwal from BlackRock. Now, BlackRock is a firm that I would think of as a very traditional private equity firm. That's how a lot of us know BlackRock. Some of us may even have money in some BlackRock managed funds. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about how you're bringing BlackRock um, into this market and what your view is and what you think you can offer. Sure, so it's important to uh, recognize that BlackRock is a very large firm um, and I don't speak for every silo within BlackRock. So I sit within the credit and special situations platform. Um, so that means I'm spending most of my time looking at credit oriented investments. Uh, we have invested across the capital structure so our group has gone into um, equity, structured equity, unsecured, second lien, um, and, and, and first lien financings. In terms of what we are trying to do, I would say it's bifurcated in, in probably two buckets. Um, bucket one is more on the opportunistic side, and that could really be anywhere across the capital structure. Um, is there something special to do that um, offers the economics that are interesting to us? And then on the other bucket, it would be um, you know, trying to explore whether there's a way for us to get more involved systematically. And I think uh, where we've been spending some time more recently is on the unit tranche lending side of the world. But I think the, um, you know, it's an open question of whether the opportunity set is 
is big enough and you know to, to, to be meaningful to us. Um, you know, we, we are also trying to write larger check sizes. Um, you know, in theory, we could write a billion dollar check size, but the reality of the market is you have the commercial banks that are ready at a certain transaction threshold. So it's kind of finding that middle ground where we can deploy enough capital on terms that um, work for us. What's your target size deal? Um, I mean, I, I, I'd love to you know, write a billion dollar check if I could. Um, it's difficult to get those terms um, that are you know, attractive enough for us. So I would say on the, on the smaller side, you know, trying to write at least $50 million tickets at a time. And that could be across the spectrum again. That could be a Unitronch uh, first lien. It could be um, you know, a second lien or a higher LTV first lien or you know, you know, a structured investment as well. So could, might you come into a deal in three different places, you know, let me put it this way, more than one different place in a capital structure? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're not beholden to playing in any piece of the capital structure. We will look at anything and everything. Uh, we're, we're very much focused on downside protection and the overall value of the asset um, as opposed to the exact structuring of it. You know, if the value is there, uh, you should be able to structure a solution. Hmm. Thank you. To Shantanu's uh, left is uh, Christoph Topher. Uh, I've known Christoph for a while, mostly through Borealis Maritime, where you were ship manager, an owner, you partnered with various uh, uh, private equity uh, funds to uh, create portfolio companies. But you come to us today um, as a director of Australis Maritime uh, Limited. Tell us a little bit about that and where you fit in this uh, alternative finance puzzle. Thanks, Larry. Christoph Topfeyer, Director of uh, Australis Maritime, which is our latest uh, and newest venture that we just uh, officially announced or made public at the Capital Links Forum in London, uh, which is one of the new alternative asset uh, lenders, uh, so the ones that we're speaking about here as well. Um, we are, um, just, as I said, just starting out. Uh, we are looking at uh, a unitranche um, you know, kind of uh, loan structure. Uh, so we are lending against assets. Um, we are looking to uh, lend into the higher uh, percentages than what traditional banks would do. Um, and we are basically here to underwrite asset risk. Uh, so we have a strong sector view on, on segments when we lend into. And um, we are. this is a complementary business to what we do on the Borealis Maritime side, uh, which we have developed into a, a, you know, a substantial uh, owning platform these days. So what is Borealis, what is Australis? We are basically uh, called an investment manager, a ship manager, and we are uh, working with um, private equity. Uh, we have, uh, over the last few years, worked a lot with uh, KKR um, and also on the alternative asset side on Australis Maritime. Um, KKR is one of the partners as well as Oak Hill. Um, so this is uh, two substantial private equity groups that are backing this new venture. Um, and we are looking to really deploy capital uh, across all segments. Um, we're quite agnostic around uh, the sectors. Well, we have obviously a very subjective view on uh, which sector we like and where we are happy to take higher risks uh, as well. So we go up to sometimes 80% on, on lending against an asset. Uh, and at that moment, you obviously have to have a very strong uh, view on, on the, the, the sector that you're lending against, uh, the risk profile you're taking on, um, and the exposure you, you're, you're basically building in your, in your credit book. Um, so we are still, as I said, new. Uh, officially launched about a week ago, 10 days ago, and uh, we, are, we have signed our first term sheets, uh, so we are quite hopeful that this space, um, or quite, you know, quite confident this space will be quite attractive. It's obviously last space. It's a space that the banks have uh, partly vacated. There's obviously still lenders there, um, but there's a migration towards the corporate credit side, meaning the larger owners are able to access financing, the smaller owners are not. Some of these smaller owners are very good operators, um, but they are stretched on their ability to either attract bank financing or um, to offer the right of cash flow or security on the corporate and lending side that, uh, that a bank would, would take. Some of these owners are also too small to offer cross-selling you know, abilities for banks uh, to justify lending to a small owner. And this is where, where we are coming in. This is where some of our competitors are coming in to 
provide debt financing at a higher cost, but also at the same time we're replacing uh, partly equity with what we're doing. So if you're pricing your equity correctly, uh, you are actually looking at our funding as being probably quite attractive. So you're looking at transactions that the, the traditional banking sector now would not handle, but might have in the in the past. But you know, surely, surely you're not you're not looking at the uh, uh, these uh, uh, dodgy uh, tra dodgy and small transactions that uh, that Shreyas uh, Chipokati mentioned in the prior prior panel. So could you give us a little bit more color on? What your what your target transaction looks like, and and perhaps as a subsidiary question or a related question would be, who do you compare uh, yourself as Australis uh, to into the current market? Would it be a merchant in maritime and out of Norway or um, Entrust Pramal um, here out of New York? Sure. Which so what's the ideal uh, transaction for us is probably somewhere at 20, 30 million dollars. However, we can go down as low as five and we can go up as high as 100. So you know, we don't want to have maybe the first transaction be $100 million, but uh, over time, that's definitely where we can uh, go to and what we can lend. So we're there to do small transactions on, uh, on even smaller vessels, uh, stuff that banks wouldn't touch generally. And as I said, we, we're, taking, uh, we're underwriting uh, quite a bit of asset risk there, uh, but we're willing to do that. Um, but we also can go for larger transactions. We're looking at transactions now, which are around $65, $70 million. Um, so we do take um, what you described, the active transaction, I wouldn't see it this way, I would say I see it slightly different, but, but uh, as long as the operator is a good operator, the vessel is very good, and we like the risk profile of the transaction, $5 million can be, can be done. Um, who do we compete with? We therefore compete with someone like uh, Maritime Merchant, but they are generally at a lower risk profile, they generally don't go above the 50 or 60%, so they may be on some transaction, we could see them. Um, uh, we definitely, you know, we are competing uh, eventually with someone like Breakwater. Uh, we're potentially competing with someone like Northern Shipping Fund uh, and Trust uh, eventually potentially as well. We haven't seen much of them in, in the deals that we are looking at right now. Um, but those are the, the kind of, uh, you know, counterparts that, uh, that are definitely active and, and successful in this market right now. Hmm. Thank you. Um, continuing to move uh, to the left here, we have a Paulo Al Almeida, who's a portfolio manager with Tuft & Oceanic. Now, a lot of you out there, whether you're new in the business or been in the business for a long time, have heard of Tuft & Oceanic. They've probably done all of these things that we've, we've talked about at, at some point. More recently, I started over here, you know, looking at Tuft & from this side of the, uh, the Atlantic. I, I thought, thought of Tuft & as a, more of a portfolio manager, a fund manager, but you're telling me that you're, you're going to be a little bit more active in this alternative finance uh, um, platform as well. So could you tell me a little bit about that and what you're looking at and what Tufton's role is in this, uh, uh, in this marketplace? Uh, sure. I think the, um, the similarity that, you know, most of us have up here is that we are uh, trying to produce returns for underlying investors due to the dislocations that continue uh, in shipping. We're doing something slightly different than um, um, most of uh, what the panelists here are currently doing, which is looking at credit, we're looking at owning ships outright, um, although having not too dissimilar risk return profile in that we're typically owning our ships with no debt. So to some extent, you could think of it, think of it as um, not too dissimilar uh, risk return profile from a large piece of unitranche debt, provided that you have some charter coverage. Um, but that's been our specialty over the years in terms of uh, uh, owning, to some extent, operating uh, vessels. We're filling a vacuum slightly differently from the other guys in that they're financing ship owners that no longer have access to the banks that they used to historically, and we're buying ships outright from the same sorts of ship owners, sometimes letting the ship owners continue to manage those vessels both commercially and, and, uh, and technically, or we just bare boat charter them back to those ship owners depending on their uh, financial status. We do that primarily for pools of European capital. Uh, we manage about 1.2 billion across four or five different vehicles. Most of the money comes from pension funds that are looking for returns that are superior to real estate and infrastructure where risk return is no longer where it was five, six, seven years ago. Yields are very compressed. Um, so investing in ships at an opportune time with low values 
is an interesting diversifier for them when equity markets are very expensive, high yield markets are very expensive, and um, just about every asset class in the world other than ships uh, look fairly expensive on, on, uh, on many measures. And we do that through a number of private funds, and we also have now a London listed fund um, where we own seven ships, and we look to grow that to about 25 ships in that new vehicle over the next couple of years. Thank you. We're going to come back to some of that um, as well. Um, but I didn't want to, didn't want to miss uh, Michael Weiss from Yield Street uh, Marine Finance. Yield Street made a big splash when it uh, entered the business, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a bit of a excitement. Uh, but maybe we should hear about uh, your take on what you bring uh, to this industry and how you fit into the puzzle. Thank you, Larry. Um, so Yield Street is what's commonly known as a fintech business. What we look to achieve is we are trying to build the largest digital wealth management platform in the world. The way we do that is by accessing a variety of investment opportunities and asset classes and make them available to retail investors and allow them direct access to invest. Today, we have roughly 70,000 users and growing pretty rapidly on a monthly basis. And as a platform, we cater to asset classes like commercial real estate, litigation finance. Uh, we make loans to middle market and uh, private equity sponsored businesses, receivable finance, et cetera. One of the more recent asset classes that we went into was marine and shipping. For those of you that have followed us a little bit, you'll know that our first investment in this asset class was about May. And I think today our portfolio stands circa 125 million. The pipeline looks like we'll probably do another 250 to 350 by the end of the year. So what we focus on in the shipping asset class is, the way I like to think about it is we're situational investors. We think that, like many others here, as a result of the lack of capital or the inefficiency of capital in the space, there's a number of opportunities that have presented themselves. I would say that we are sector agnostic, but we live within a certain set of rules in our investment philosophy. So to date, our investments have been in the dry market as well as creating facilities for cash buyers in the scrap market. What we're looking to do is we're watching carefully where the tanker market is going. We think that it's becoming time for us to make some moves there, and I expect that we will, as well as creating a specific type of strategy for cash buyers that want to pick up larger transactions, specifically VLCCs and the like in that market. What we typically finance um, or our structures include sale leasebacks, first mortgages, and um, corporate facilities are generally for secondhand ships. To your question that I noticed you're asking everybody, our average deal size is somewhere between 25 and 75 million is what we're looking for. The average ship value is somewhere between 10 and 15 million. So we're often buying two ships at a time or financing two ships or more at a time. And we look to, to continue to expand that. What we see exciting about shipping is, given the dislocation of capital, asset values, and the volatility, as well as the bleak performance over the last decade or so, the secondhand ships, specifically in the dry market, are of a value where it's, to us, attractive to buy them. Charter rates are profitable going in. And if you look over a two to four year time horizon, you could be pretty close to scrap. So when thinking about downside protection, when thinking about how to identify good return, good risk reward opportunities for investors, shipping to me at the moment seems like one that's attractive to us. Um, as a team and as a business, we're really excited about it. Some of you might know that in order to launch this business, we brought over George Kambanis. George was the founder and CEO of Deloitte Greece and ran that for close to four decades. Um, so we're committed to the shipping space. We're opening an office, in Athens, an office in Athens. We're hiring people there. And I suspect that over the next year or two, you'll see us um, continue to do a lot of interesting investments there and be sector agnostic as the market either recovers or dips in different, different specific um, asset classes. We'll jump in and out, whether it's dry or tankers or some other, some other area within, within the asset class. So you're, you're, um, you're asset agnostic as a, as a platform, but you find shipping or at least certain parts of the, of the shipping world right now to be attractive for what your model is? Yeah, I, as, a, as a matter of principle, historically across all the asset classes that I've invested in over the last decade plus, 
I found that investing in businesses, at least the type of situational credit for the most part that we do, there might be equity upside, but it's really a credit focused business. I don't like to be a lender or an investor to businesses that are losing money. I find that that typically causes some strife within a year, within two years, if people think, hey, we're going to lose money for six months, then we're going to make a bunch of money, and then it doesn't go that quickly, that ends up being a strain on the relationship. And uh, for me, it's not so much, hey, let's try to get a five-bagger if tankers are so cheap. I'd rather wait to see the asset class and the strategy improve a little bit, profitability come in, charter rates come up, or asset values come down, and then I'll make a little bit less money, but it's a better risk reward and a better relationship for the borrower for us and for everybody. So we'll continue to monitor the asset classes within shipping and wait for those characteristics to show themselves. We're not in a rush to deploy capital into something that we don't think makes sense just yet. Thank you. Of course, the presumption is that the, the reason we're even talking about alternative finance today and have previously spoken about uh, private <coughs> equity is that the banks have, um, uh, are less invested, if you will, in the, in the shipping market uh, as, a, as a whole. Um, that there's a, a large gap that's been created, a uh, need, for, need for capital. Uh, I, I just throw this out to anyone who wants to, to tackle it. Do you think that you all and your comrades collectively are going to be able to plug that gap? Or will the lack of capital be a damper on overbuilding? Or any other insights that you might have in that regard that you'd like to share with our guests? Christoph? I think so, that uh, generally the lack of uh, bank capital right now has certainly dampened the, uh, the ordering. I think that uh, some of the owners um, had to think twice about how large an order or if they are even placing an order. Uh, so I think that that's, that's good for the market uh, in general. Um, you, know, you look at the alternative uh, capital that's coming in right now to finance shipping, um, it's by far not um, as large as the capital that's still withdrawing. So, you know, we obviously have had some banks quite publicly, you know, reducing their portfolios, Commerzbank and then others. Um, but you're looking at uh, the refinancing still of balloons and you see still, you know, some of the um, lenders that haven't made public announcement about reducing their portfolios, we still see them also uh, migrating towards uh, fewer clients, bigger clients, and um, the balloon refinancing risk for some of the smaller owners are quite substantial. And so I think that overall uh, the space is quite large uh, and, and not all um, uh, holes can be plucked at this stage. So there is qu quite a lot of opportunities, I think, out there, for sure. Mm, thank you. Uh, Paolo, when you were describing your source of funds, uh, you mentioned pension plans and some other similar types of institutions. You also hinted that perhaps the return expectations of some of your investors might generally be lower now looking for, I don't want to put words in your mouth, or perhaps more steady cash flow, less speculative uh, re returns. Um, I, just using that as a, as a theme for a moment, I want to ask a question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind and has been asked um, uh, to a lot of people in this, in this area before. You know, shipping has notoriously been a low margin business. We, we've discussed that. Um, uh, you're familiar with that. Uh, the, the banks, of course, were traditionally cheap sources of capital. Alternative financing sources, to the extent that they have existed historically in, in shipping, tended to be much higher price, you know, MES debt, now a little bit more um, unit tranche. But not to pick on you, because I really throw this question out to everyone on the panel, is, you know, can those shipping customers, those ship owners, who used to go to the banks who were at this table previously, give you an appropriate rate of return? Is, are, are your risk enhanced? Um, is, there a, is there a fit? Is there a true fit? Are there a lot of deals getting done? Well, um, I think the, the um, other panelists are better able to answer that regarding debt. Um, you know, we're not, we're not a debt provider, we're actually replacing to some extent certain um, small to medium sized ship owners or at least owning ships legally that they used to own but now they can run commercially and technically so they can have synergies across their fleet. But we're not really a provider uh, of finance other than arguably through sale leaseback transactions. And in those cases we have found quite a few deals where for whatever reason either a 
very good family-owned company used to have eight banks in their group and now have five banks, or some of the banks don't want to finance ships that are 16, 17 years old, um, they're sort of stuck. They have contracts to move cargoes, chemicals, wood pulp, windmill blades, interesting cargoes that um, are fairly inelastic. They need the ships, say a lease back is all they can do, and they're able to offer us a decent, a decent return on those. But a Just little... because the banks are no longer there in that end of the market. And of course, we'll compete to some extent with um, some of the panelists here, but um, you know, as Christoph was hinting at before, it's a big space. It's a big pool for all of us to swim in. And hopefully, um, we'll keep the pool interesting and not, uh, not ruin it for each other. Christoph? I just want to say, I mean, you know, so what is private equity looking for? You know, this is different private equity than uh, the private equity that has gone into the high risk equity structures. So this is a lower return required capital from the private equity world or from, you know, companies uh, in, in, the, in the institutional capital market. So, you know, we're not talking uh, high, high, you know, teens or 20 type returns here. So it, it's a different, different cost of capital. And therefore, if you, if, if you structure rightly, I mean, we, we're looking at high single digit total returns. Um, you know, and we are, we are we going, as I said earlier, 70, 80% in the capital structure. This is potentially attractive capital. Hmm. Larry, I would jump in. I would say that sure, um, a few interesting things. One is, in any market, it's not exclusive to shipping. When traditional banks and capital pull out of the market, it kind of right-sizes the overall industry. Right? So asset values were coming down. We saw that happen in different subsectors, which creates additional profitability when charter rates come up. So I think that one of the good things is we're seeing... Um, we're seeing more profitable lines of business come into the market than if you study the historicals. I think that the, your, your true tier one borrowers, um, the most legacy and storied owners and borrowers are going to continue to be at banks. What we're seeing is a tremendous amount of activity with what we hope is considered tier two. So been in business 20 plus years, very attractive amount of liquidity. And it's more situational opportunity. So it's not people that want to buy a ship to own for the next 15, 20 years. It's people that are looking at the asset class today, saying there's been a modest increase over the last number of months. The charter rates continue to be attractive, have a certain view of the market over the next 24 to 36 months. How do we take advantage of that? If we buy it all cash or we buy it with lower leverage, we'll be only able to buy less. We want to play on a certain, uh, on a bet that we're making, so hey, can we go out and buy five drives, 10 drives, and the same thing is gonna happen in the market. So I think from our vantage point, our origination and pipeline continue to be diverse and attractive. I don't think that um, the people up here, if we double the number of people up here, that the TAM is too small, that the TAM is big, the deal sizes are relatively chunky. So they're, they're interesting, and I think that the lack of capital on one hand is really, um, it's right-sizing the overall industry, right? It helped, over the last number of years, it helped limit the order book and it's gonna continue to clean up house a little bit. The same way VLCCs are moving into scrap, et cetera. Thank you. I see we're extraordinarily low on time, but I wanted to ask one other, one other question. Uh, Shantanu, if I could just pick on, on you for this one. What is it like engaging with the uh, shipping credits in this business, new, you know, people who are new to you? Uh, they're used to dealing with banks and operating in a certain way. What's your insight on it? So I, I think, going back to my earlier comment, we're, we're finding more traction in the, um, you know, kind of the, the situational lending space where these are parties that are, you know, smaller. Um, I think it's been some frustration in terms of dealing with them, in terms of sorting out who's real and who's not. Um, you know, the parties who are real understand uh, the nimbleness, the, the scale of the capital, and they want to move quickly. And then there's other parties that want to negotiate every single aspect uh, of a term sheet, which makes sense be given the value of a strong balance sheet. But if you're talking to me and not a commercial bank, there, there probably is a reason why, and that probably you know requires moving quickly. And there's definitely been situations that have been very frustrating where you know, folks want to negotiate, 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 and they, they you know, lose sight of the ball in terms of a closing timeline or just closing at all. And I, and I can give stories like that. So we like engaging with parties that value us, value our capital and our focus, and, and want to move quickly. 
Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the, all the members of the panel and for those of you out there who are ship owners looking for money that you can no longer get from your bank, these are the gentlemen to speak to. Thank you.